and uh, <laughs> do you not want a drink? No. <laughs> I can't there just have go. one, you see. I can't have ten, ten. What happened to your coke? You finished it, you finished down, down, mate. It's thirsty, man. It's not all that driving. Is it? Well, good, good, good. Let's wait for two more. Do you want to grab a seat? And then we'll, we'll, kick, we'll kick off. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Take Off. Um, this is a Two Funky Arts project, um, looking at the music industry. One of three or four, three main events that we're going to be doing this year. My name's Yao Wusu. I'm a creative consultant, and I work across the music industry in a variety of different ways. So I work with brands, organizations, and creatives. Um, on this day, I'm a host. So I'll be hosting this panel. Um, I've got two wonderful, inspiring individuals that are going to help you guys uh, find out more about distribution. Okay? Um, just by show of hands, again, we've done this before, but just show of hands. How many of you are artists? Okay, music creators in some manner. Managers, promoters, miscellaneous. The guy at the back, what are you? Go on, tell me. Label. Yeah? Label? Yeah? You said label? Okay, cool. So we've got, we got the independent labels. So obviously everyone here, some, some man, if you're making or working with an artist who releases um, recorded music, will need to understand distribution. So this session will break down a little bit about what distribution is, but I suppose more importantly, what makes it the most effective um, process for the music that you're releasing, okay? That's where we're gonna go. I'm gonna, I've got a couple of questions for these guys, obviously, but please do, if you want to ask questions, just put your hand up and we'll, we'll hopefully get around everything. The session will be about an hour and a half, give or take, so we should have enough time to go through things. So I'm going to do a quick intro to you guys, just a brief one line, but we're going to get into deep, deep, deep about yourselves <laughs> and what you do and how you're so successful. So I'll start with my, my old friend, Mike Murphy, who's a scouser, so... You have to deal with two scousers, I don't know if this happens very much. <laughs> um, who works for Ditto. We'll get into the proper titles, but he knows distribution inside out. And then Governor B, who I'm sure a lot of you know, who last week had the number one rap hip-hop album in the UK. Independent artist, been doing his thing for Can't years and years and years. <laughs> <laughs> So knows a thing about how you distribute, how you run campaigns, you know, how you're prepared. So we're going to find, obviously, you know, lots of information. But again, please leave this session with everything that you need from it in terms of understanding online distribution. Cool? Any questions at this point? We're good to go? Uh, Mike, I want to come back to you. You can give us your formal title. Every, every, every time I speak to you, it changes. You've got different responsibilities. Yeah. Another zero on the pay packet. <laughs> it's getting a bit silly now. Do you know what I mean? You, you were going to bring your, your, your private jet, but you couldn't find a place to land. In yeah, yeah, yeah. So t uh, yeah, tell us more about what you do and how you got to where you are. Because like, no, no, you know, people don't wake up and go and want to work at a distribution company. But obviously, you've made it work wonderfully, and you're, you're a bit of a star of the game. So tell us a little bit. No, I appreciate that. I think you've been very overly kind there. Um, but yeah, so I'm Mike Murphy, I work for Ditto Music, we're a global digital distribution company on our way to nearly 1 million users worldwide, so our mission to, to be the biggest truly independent distributor, uh, our, our mission, we really are on track and making some big waves at the minute. Been doing this about 8 to 10 years as a business, um, me myself, I've been with the business coming up to 7. Uh, my official title at the minute <laughs> is, uh, and it grows and grows all the time, um, is uh, Global Head of Events and Partnerships, but I'm also an uh, Artist and Label Services Manager, so obviously working, putting on events for Ditto Music and partnerships with the likes of big brands and festivals, the likes of The Great Escape, Sound City, BBC, um, wherever it might be. Uh, we also do our own in-house events like Ditto X. We do at the O2 in London every year. Uh, but I've just done one in New York as well. We're going back to LA to do another one. Networking and conference events, like just like this kind of thing. Um, in terms of my artist and label services manager role, uh, I sign artists to our label service division, which is, as opposed to a subscription, distribution account. We, a bit like a label, we do a bit of A&R. We, we scout, we, we take on... Uh, campaigns and sign artists to develop them either A, take them to that next level when they're making some noise, 
and bring in our expertise of pitching for playlists, talking to the SPs like Spotify and Apple, working a radio campaign, digital marketing, uh, and then building a whole campaign to bring in our knowledge and uh, joining the dots basically might be like building a tour, the whole shebang, the whole campaign wrapped around um, a release with us. Um, so that's kind of, my, I'm the indie rock guy, I guess, with Ditto Music in that respect. Um, and a host of other things where we've got a chain of coffee shops as well uh, in the high streets <laughs> in Liverpool, Manchester. We're relocating London at the minute, so I do a bit of marketing and work there as well to extend our brand onto the high street so artists can walk in, have a hub, uh, somewhere to play, and flock their music as well. So, yeah, that's about it. That's about it. You've got to give them a round of applause for that. So. <laughs> Uh, and as, a, as for Howard, you still manage sometimes? Yeah, you just oh, I do a bit of management manage. on the side as well. <laughs> oh, and I'm an artist, I write yeah. music, well, I'll, get, I'll get to that later. But, um, but yeah, so I was an artist, I was releasing my own music, I wanted to be independent, so I formed a label, uh, I was in a band that had a niche, it was like a psych rock niche, I put out a lot of physical product, uh, sorted out my own tours and did the whole 360 stuff, learnt loads the hard way, got into the weeds, um, and then it was the, the the founders of Ditto Music kind of took a took a, uh, a liking to what I was doing, applied for a job, boom, started at the bottom and just worked my way up. Passion, determination, hard work, uh, and just looking at it from the artist's point of view is probably what's given me that gave me that angle all these years. But yeah, that's about it. Perfect. Thank you very much. Same question to you. Obviously, tell us what you do, but you don't do now. That would be easier. Tell us what you do <laughs> and, and how you got to this point and. You know, in a in a nutshell, how'd you get to the point even of having a number one album? Like, yeah. Well, I started rapping in the playground at school um, just for a joke. Ended up being quite good at it. It was just like clashing, rap battling, saying some not very nice things about people's mums and stuff. And I would always win the clashes and stuff. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And I grew up that kind of state culture, a place called Custom House in East London. In year eleven, one of my boys was murdered on my estate and hit me hard, but then I looked at like, some of the music um, that I was making, the lyrics that I was writing, and it just felt like a bit weird to be glorifying the stuff I was glorifying. So that kind of inspired me to change my lyrics and start writing more positive stuff. Um, and I guess that put me into a bit of like a niche bracket within the rap and hip hop community in the UK. And so it was clear that maybe like a major label would never look at me or sign me because I'm a niche kind of artist, and so I had to find another way. And so I think the interesting thing about my journey is, is I've started um, distribution right from like chatting to a computer basically with like CD Baby, Ditto a bit later on down the line, and then asking questions throughout my career, building relationships, and then moving to like a distribution company called Absolute, who are um, quite bespoke. They like like artists that are on the come up and that kind of stuff. Then after that, moving to the orchard, and now I'm with Virgin, and so I've gone right across the scope of like I'm just chatting to like this bot basically, just chatting to an actual human being, and learned a lot of stuff along the way. Um, I think the the most important thing that I've learned is to is to ask questions, man, because like I talked about seeing things from an artist perspective. We have to learn to try and see things from like a distributor's perspective, because one of the first questions they might ask is. <coughs> stuff like who's on your team and I'm like well it's me sometimes I pretend to be someone else uh, and send emails on behalf of someone else but they just get you thinking a bit a bit differently okay cool man who's gonna do that my PR who's gonna write my bio maybe I've got a bridge and that's good at that stuff that can join it and then I can go back and say I've got these people on my team that makes them sit up a little bit and take you a bit more seriously and learning stuff like that man um, and I talk about asking questions because fellow artists that um, I'm naturally like a reserved person, but fellow artists have told me stuff about distribution that I wouldn't otherwise have known. Um, and so I got a mate called Barney, Barney Artist, and I was just chilling with him randomly one day, and he was like, oh yeah, I just got 20 bags from my distributor. So I was like, what do you mean you got 20 bags from my distributor? Like, they're not saying they're distribution. And he was like, oh yeah, like, I've put out a few albums with them. I'm at the end of my term, it's like the fifth year I've been with them. And so I said I was gonna move my catalog, they said they'll pay me to keep it. If I didn't have that conversation, I wouldn't have known it. Um, so I think don't be afraid to, to ask questions. And that's probably the one thing that's helped me out um, in my career and got me to where I've got to. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd say 
is I think as artists sometimes we can think like money is the only thing that's gonna change our lives or alter the trajectory of our career. But I would actually say looking back, the most important asset that I've had is building relationships, man. Literally just making friends, man. Um, because you'll be surprised how often like, you see people at random events, they'll drop a little nugget, you'll take on their advice, they'll call you into the office and you're in a situation that you otherwise wouldn't have been in. Um, so yeah, I can't lie, man. Like, I've benefited heavily from, from distribution, making friends and asking questions. And in terms of getting to where I am now with the number one and stuff, it's just believing in yourself. I've got a theory that if you're good enough, always improving, and then you can do it for as long as possible and be consistent. It's just eventually something has to happen. I'm not saying you're gonna be like the biggest artist in the world because it's basic economics, like all of us can't be that, but there's a door that's gonna open that has the potential to change your life and put you in a better position. So consistency, hard work, and just that, that self-belief that what you bring, whether it's mainstream, whether it's niche, the world needs to hear, man. Love it. Love it. Give, give them both a round of applause. And, and the reason why I say that is it's, it's the, as, the industry's big, isn't it? And like, even taking your thing is like you, you have people who get to very high heights. And some people have a hand, some people don't. But it's a place for everybody. And obviously, you guys have excelled in your roles and your spaces. And I think it should be because sometimes we all get caught up in the the number one star and this, mm. that, and the other, and all that, and it's, it's everyone can eat, everyone can contribute to the industry. So I think that's that's why I say you should have had the round of applause. So my, in a boring sense, because you started talking labour services, this, that, and the other. <laughs> what's distribution like on a in a traditional sense of it? Because I think sometimes when when it's explained the way it used to be, mm. like trucks taking CDs to shops and stuff. Sometimes it, make, it makes it a little bit clearer, but yeah. can you talk without getting into digital? What, what is distribution? That's the basic. Yeah, I, I guess in the simplest form, it's getting your music, A, whether you've done it in a, created it in a recording studio or at home, you've got it to a, uh, a level that you're happy with and you would consider to be professional, it's good enough to service the fans, um, get it from A from there to B, to digital service platforms like Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon and Deezer etc and um, in order to complete that process there's a lot of boring mind-boggling red tape the distributors go through and have deals set up and have pipelines that navigate what those dsps need in order everyone knows to what a dsp is don't they does anyone not know it's no shame but, okay so a, di a digital service platforms like apple music spotify so just digital stores where you can listen to music stream or download um, so yeah so each store has their guidelines they've there's a lot of quality control and quality checking that needs to take place from when um, an artist uploads, say, onto the Ditto platform to make sure the stores are going to be happy with that. Um, and so just, to, just, to, just to explain this, because sometimes with new artists, I find that they don't understand. They go, I've got a Spotify profile, why can't I get... Yeah. You've got to go through a distributor. You yeah. don't go... So if you've got records, and I know some of you have released a lot of records, but if you've got a, a song that you want out, you don't... I know there, are, there was talk of some platforms doing it direct, mm. but let's say for now as a broad rule, you've got to go through a distribution company like Ditto, so that's what obviously... Yeah, so we, we, we frame your release, get it to the stores, so they're happy, you're happy, and it's released. And obviously, importantly, it's monetized as well, so you're getting revenue from that. Um, we also, as a service, want to guide and support the artist on their journey as well. So as you just mentioned there about like Spotify for artists, it's just like a tool where you can create your, treat it a bit like a social media platform, you know, uh, profile images, bio, all these important things that you see when you listen to a favorite artist on Spotify. How can you get your profile looking that professional, looking that good? How do you get access to that? Um, that's obviously a Spotify tool called Spotify for artists where you log in, create an account, register, but until you've done the distribution process and get a URL, URI, by basically us distributing your content, you won't be able to claim that. So you need to go through that distribution process in order to claim that do, and the two join together. Does everyone understand that? As, how many people have released records based on, on DSPs? Okay, so everybody understands. How many of you have got Spotify for artists, for instance? Okay, how many people use it? 
update it. Okay, so we're, we're good, okay. Spotify you know, will be very pleased. Yeah, <laughs> it will be. Yeah, it's working. It's no, working. Yeah. So yeah, go on. So, and, and these are all the things that you activate, so to speak. Yeah, well, yeah, and we advise where we can as well. Because um, when, you, when you do your first release, there's a lot more to do than, you know, when you like your four singles in. Um, mapping as well, and that, what that means is if you've got a name that's been used 50 times by other artists, which, you know, from a marketing point of view, you could argue that, but let's just take that out of the equation a minute. The, that mapping could land on the wrong artist's profile, happens all the time, doesn't matter if it's this OCD baby, doesn't matter who it is. Now there are ways to, to guide that mapping when you upload the release, but until you've gone through that first release process and you've got a profile that's created by what we do, by what Spotify do and the other stores, um, you need to get to that point. And then from there, you need the distributor to help you, to support you, where if that does happen, you can contact them and go, right, that's landed on the wrong profile. Can you adjust that for us? Can you fix that for us? And we've got a team that will help do that. And the best advice I'll always give is give yourself plenty of time. There's always a rush reason why you need your single out this week. <laughs> I've got like a bit of radio play. I've got a big show. I mean, there are, there are exceptional circumstances, but my advice always is give yourself three, four, even five weeks beyond. Have a, a, a long-term plan because sometimes these things can go wrong and potentially could. Give yourself time to fix that and then get your promotion on the marketing plan ironed out as well. Loads of time. Don't, don't leave distribution to the last thought, which is what a lot of artists tend to do. <laughs> Well, while we're talking about distribution, and you, you've touched on the digital side of things, I suppose, but there's a lot of traffic, isn't there, yeah. every day? Yeah. I heard at one point they were worried. I went to a meeting, it was about five years ago, that they were worried it was going to be like 50,000 new releases a day. I think it's surpassed that. It, now, I think we've surpassed that, and you'll, you'll know specifically. But how important, then, is distributing in a proper manner? We'll get into what a proper manner is, but how important it is. Is it, or is it pointless because you're just, you're in the sea anyway? If you want to make it optimise your opportunities and you want to look attractive to the likes of Spotify, I keep picking on Spotify, but it could be in Apple Music, it could be talking about Amazon or whatever. You want to kind of take on how they would like to see your releases out. So what do they want to see? Regular releases, a lot of music coming through, activity on socials. Do you want to see on the Spotify profile stuff that stands out, so using bright colours, making sure that you're updating your bio every release, keeping that updated. Your profile photo on uh, Spotify itself, keep updating that, keep, treat it like a social media platform. I'm going, ask a, I'm going to ask an odd question. When you say they like to see it, how do they know you do it? I know that sounds odd, but is, does that information actually feed in? So when you put something on and you're releasing a record and you've been updating it every week and sending people to the platform, do they, you know, we hear that people listen to your stuff and all that, but, but do they look at the activity as well? I think some of it is to help in terms of, like, from a fan's point of view, get their attention. Okay. You know, there's a lot of content out there. But I think from stuff like putting your latest trackers, you know, pick your, your artist pick and linking your shows via merch bar uh, or whatever it is, or merchandise, as well as, um, you know, kind of utilising their tool I think that's something that when it gets to the point where they're, they're listening uh, to it, they'll yeah, know it's got to their point, like it might get to an editorial, the algorithms are starting to kick in, they're like, well, this is interesting. They're like, the distributor has highlighted this release as well, we'll get to that in a bit. Um, then they'll go like, right, we like what they're doing, we like their attitude, you know, they've got a good team around them, um, you know, and I think it'll just optimise and maybe increase the opportunities that could come from like editorial or marketing opportunities as well. Cool. Any questions at this point? Because we're going to go deeper. I've actually just off the back of what you said. I yeah, that that's a good way to cut through, to try and utilise new features that these platforms provide. Because a lot of the times, the bigger the artists that have the huge fan base and get the support anyway, they aren't doing that. So when Spotify sees you're pinning something, or Instagram sees that you're using the new you know, add audio to your profile um, feature, they sit in offices and think, oh, artists are really going to use this. And when you do it, they sit up and take notice. It validates, and them, yeah, it validates what they've probably spent years developing, <laughs> I suppose, yeah. isn't yeah. it? No, 100%. Ditto X that I did in New York. I had the, the global head of independence for Spotify, Jen Massett, lovely lady. Been with the, the company a long time. And she's very blunt. It, like, we like to see that. We don't like you paying hundreds of pounds to, to pitch for these unofficial playlists. We don't like to see it, full stop. She's very blunt about it. Where sometimes it's a bit of a grey area about should you pay companies to, to pitch for playlists. 
literally they want that job. They mm. want to be the ones that, well, if they're going to do it editorially, great. If it's going to trigger algorithmical lists, great. But you know, they don't want to see people paying money to companies who benefit from adding you into these third party lists that are created independently, who are basically, you know, earn the money off someone else. That's not what they want. I'm going to come to you in a sec, uh, Governor, but I, I wanted to ask an, another question, Mike. So in terms of like the distribution pipeline process, will you talk through how it actually works from an artist delivering a record and how they deliver it and then the steps that you do before it's released? Yeah. Um, but again, just before we even do that, do you want to talk about some of the digital stores? Because I think we're on the habit where we reference Spotify quite quickly and yeah. that's obviously the large, largest one, but there's probably 10 maybe, that probably about six that are the major ones, but like yeah. there's, there's, there's quite a couple that you should actually be aware of that you're making sure, because you might have a spike on one of the other ones rather than, you know, like I know Audio Mac sometimes is well, great. For I was gonna get onto Audio stuff. Mac, yeah, yeah, yeah 100%, because I think you're absolutely right, picking on Spotify and Apple, but I mean, Apple have got to highlight because they pay better, um, which, which is a fact. And in the likes of US, the, you know, there's been times they've overtook Spotify and popularity. But I think stores like Deezer, uh, stores like Audio Mac uh, are definitely examples of, I say smaller DSPs, but they're, they're a bit more niche. Like for example, Audio Mac, uh, almost like a, a curated only uh, platform. That basically means it can't just go through a distributor and just everything that's uploaded will land with them. They have a they, they see the selection of catalog from a distributor and choose what they want to have on their platform. So that's expanded all the time. So they've got a bit of a niche uh, business model there. Um, but their marketing opportunities are brilliant when you get behind an artist. They're doing like pop-ups on mobile phone devices. They're doing um, like blog takeovers. They're doing a lot more hands-on stuff with artists. And I think when a, a DSP is on the rise and getting more and more popular, that's something to take advantage of. Then there's like platforms like Beatport. I don't, does anyone do like EDM music or electronic music that uses Beatport? Cool, so you know about the Beatport label and there's a, there's a lot more steps that need to happen. That takes a bit longer as well, so refer back to my uh, message about like leaving yourself loads of time. But uh, yeah, should we go through the boring steps? Let's do them. Yeah, Vital steps. Vital steps. Um, so yeah, obviously, um, have an account with a distributor, we'll say data music in this case. And, how, and let's even go, like, how does that, like, what, have an account, what, have what an are account. the variations in having an account? So basically, data music, there's a free trial, so if you're not with us, us, you can get three, three months. months for free anyway. So you go to our website, you sign up, you, you create an account, it's very, very easy, it takes literally five, ten minutes. Once you're in, there's an uploader tool on there, and you just basically hit the uploader tool, and it'll start walking you through the steps. It's four pages that you've run through, very, very easy explains every single detail. It asks you what it needs, like your release title, your uh, artist name to create an artist profile, the, the cover of the release, single or album, and then you just literally follow the steps and then you get into metadata, which is the title of the tracks, um, the, the CMP lines, copyright and all that stuff, uh, ISRC codes, we can create them, or um, you, know, you, you may have one, that's a whole conversation yeah, in itself we'll get to. Um, and just keep following the steps. Where in the world do you want it released? What stores do you want it to go to? What release date would you like? And you just literally follow the steps. Pop it in the basket, confirm, and then it'll go into a queue. And then we have a, a large content team who go into that queue and they basically will quality check to make sure those releases are suitable for the DSPs. If, if they are, they're all good. Boom, they'll go right to the stores and then they're in the stores like kind of queue. And then they'll basically go live on that release date. If there's a problem with the releases, our content team will contact you and say, right, these are the steps that you need to what, correct. What's the biggest problem? That, it's the artwork, artwork. isn't it? Artwork. <laughs> so the biggest one's redundant information. So it could be like, just, th just think of a single cover. Ideally, artist name, art, the, the title of the release, maybe a featuring artist. The stuff sometimes creatively that gets put on there is absolutely completely redundant, irrelevant, but sometimes there's, a, there's an artistic reason for that, it's relevant to the lyrics or the message or the marketing. Sometimes it's just so random, like they put a logo of their own record label on there, or um, you know, it, it's 99p in a star, all these <laughs> nonsense things that are so out of date. Um, sometimes it's literally someone on it, not even an iPhone, on a Nokia, has just got a no <laughs> And it's just like the face, it's, like, it's just like, 
No, and and, and uh, does that get flagged manually, or do you have some kind of no, bot that just AI? It? You could argue, he you finds know, it. the the job's in trouble 10, 20 years down the line. But at oh, the right. minute, manually, we have a team okay. of people who go through, listen, and look at all these details. Your defo, your your guys are defo <laughs> looking at AI to do that job, isn't it? <laughs> I know that. Yeah, there's a, there's a combo in itself. Um, but but that's it. Yeah. So once it's checked, we let you know what you need to fix. You need to correct it. Once it's corrected, then we'll check it again. Yeah, that looks good. It'll go to stores. The, these steps obviously slow down the process, so again, we always keep referring back to loads of time, so this stuff can be looked at. Cool, yeah. Yeah, you said that as distributors, you like, get behind artists and stuff like that, so what actually attracts a distributor to an artist? What can an artist do to get a distributor to get them to actually support a distributor? That's a great question, because that kind of segues into the other side, label services. So some um, distributors just basically will look for that behind the scenes, we, we do have something called Ditto Plus, is where we look for the, look for artists to use our platform and like, wow, okay, we're getting a report to say they're doing good streaming numbers. Or maybe like our A&R team, like I know the, the indie rock world, so if I know an artist who uploads on our platform, I'll know the name. Um, and then we can kind of just get a little report and have a little look. And then we can reach out to that artist and go, cool, loving your music, what's your next plans? You know, have you got a single coming up? Just get a conversation going one to one and just see if What's in the report? So you said like you brought up a report and stuff, so what's in the report? What um, are you looking at? Just streaming numbers, at, uh, attention rate on um, on the likes of Spotify as well, so that enables us to know if it's fake streaming or not. Yeah. So, you know, if, if obviously someone's got um, 50,000 streams and the, the retention rate's like literally like 2% or something like that, people are listening for literally milliseconds. But it's got 50,000 streams, you know something's not right. So flashes out the authentic from the from the fake. So that's a tool that you you, you got access to that because I know Spotify because you can go to Spotify and go yeah my fan base is this and everybody loves my music and they go no they switch off after 21 seconds. You you've got access to that information not, too. Not access to Spotify but we No but I'm saying own. your own one. Yeah so we see the set we see those Deep, that, key, you know. key points yeah. Deep. To a point to a point I mean there's always ways of feeling people. So the attention you look and go they're not really real fans, they're just giving you a go, one well, go. And that. It's like there's, there's patterns as well beyond the retention rate, the stuff like, you know, there's someone from like Manchester and like all the streaming's coming from like a, a, another part of the world and it just doesn't make sense. And then you look at the market and you start digging a little bit deeper into social, it's like it's so random. It doesn't make sense. It's not making sense. Not that you'd, you know, base it just on that, but if you, if you do, if you look into it further, and sometimes there's negative reasons why we're looking at it, maybe there's a copyright claim that comes in, which is where you've released your music on via Ditto, it's on platforms, and someone will contact us and say, oh, that's my music, they didn't have permission to release that, and then we have to do a little bit of investigation, so another reason why we look into that stuff. Is there a threshold number? Like, for example, my label does about 15,000 streams a month, month in, month out, for the last 12 months. What's your threshold to get the labels or the distributors attention? Because we as distributors, which obviously one of the competitors, but is there a level of streamage that you look for before you get in contact? Streamage, I like that word. I like that. Is that a thing? Is that actually a thing? I like the idea. Yeah. 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 You know, being brutally honest, right? If, if you're independently using Ditto music and then something really, you, know, you have a moment and streaming's going into millions. We'd love to talk to you because not only can we bring a lot of value to the long-term goal of growing that opportunity, um, then there's value in for, for Ditto Music as well. So it's a mutual thing, uh, like any deal, like any record deal, distribution deal, the, 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 the value is mutual. Uh, any artist's favor, of course. If, if it's kind of where you can see there's a bit of noise. Well, like streaming starting to grow. Maybe like you're getting a lot of radio play for your artists. Maybe uh, your live appetite's growing. Tickets are, are moving. You announce some more activations, more live shows. Maybe your merch is moving. Press. Sometimes you can go, okay, well, there's potential there, but it could be early days. It could be for me personally, and all our team have a different style. I can either a just keep you in a bit of a hub and keep in touch with you and give you some hints and tips and develop you within the Ditto system as a, in a hub environment until the point where things are starting to grow. Now we can talk label services, now's the right time. So when I when we pitch your new stuff to like Spotify and Apple, your streaming numbers are more attractive to them uh, in terms of editorial. Um, or yeah, there's those conversations where the streaming's like really high. So I know I answered your question, but it, it's hard to give an exact number. But I mean, I, I, mean, I assume it might be relative to genre and 
what's happening in the wider market space and stuff like that. Yeah, man, I mean, it's about frequency as well. If it's your first ever release and you get 15,000 streams a month, that's good going. There's yeah. lots to commend yeah. on that. And then the next, the job from there is to build on that. So, you know, it, it's all about frequency, it's all about the right time to have that conversation. And, you know, for me, I like to be, you know, it may not be the right time for label service, but how can we get you to there? So, yeah. I'm gonna, is that what I, oh, go on. Yeah, yeah, what do you think of uh, tools like chart metric? Oh, I, I live by it. Explain my, chart metric. My, my daily Explain. Bible. Ex Explain <laughs> it. Uh, so chart metric is a tool that gives you visibility about the likes of, I guess, an artist's performance on the DSPs and beyond radio and chart positioning as well and download positions. Uh, so for someone in A&R or someone working in label services for a distribution company, it's a really handy tool to, to get access. So when we're having those conversations about artists, we can go, okay, let's go a little bit behind the scenes and see what the demographic is, if they've had any editorial in the past, what the, even the, the unofficial playlist, we can see what that's like. Um, and without going too deep, the SPI, which is the Spotify Popularity Index, oh my God. Spotify have a ranking for every single artist in the world using their platform. Can you, can you pull up, can you see anything? Well, chart metric, you can see this. No, but you can, you can yeah, free chart metric, can you see? You can, can see anything? You can compare, like local art, you can say, I want to just search in Leicester. I want to just search which is within uh, track music genre. I mean, you can kind of filter things. Yeah, but, but, but it's open because it, uh, we, we had the session, Chris. Yeah, 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 yeah. You on it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but you can go, you can see anyone's as long as you've got a chart metric account. You've got it, you can't. Well, just, there's, different I can't level, there's different levels of accounts. Okay. Know, accounts. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, like you've got to you, you, yeah, so you've like, have uh, a. Yeah, we're paying for accounting. Yeah, pay for accounting, you'll access this. So, every artist who's released on DSPs, you'll have some statistics on there. Um, and as a distributor, do you get insights that only distributors can have on artists, whether they're with you guys or not? Chartmetric are the only company that provide that kind of information, but we use You're it. You're paid by Chartmetric. <laughs> <laughs> but they've, they've done a couple of conferences for me. But, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll say that. but no, seriously, yeah, the SPI, I mean, I, I, I think you do need to also like that to find out or speak to Spotify directly um, using one of their forms or whatever. But, it's a way that Spotify basically that's their value on that artist at that time. It's like monthly listers go up and go down, and it 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 changes very frequently, probably by by week by day. Um, but if you're like 30, 35, 40, 45 out of 100 SPI, you, there's there's more chance you're going to get editorial playlist, and we will know that. So we'll look at that and go, okay, well the SPI is at that rate. So we know it's good for us. It's a good time for the artist to have a label service. What are you told me it's about song, Mike. <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go over to the like talk about what Mike likes when he's caught on these artists. Then what does Mike need? What does the distributor? What what about the artist? You're looking, you worked hard on this music. What are you looking for in the distributor? You changed a couple of distributors. Like so, you know when you're yeah and you go this is my music. What are you looking for right there? I think when I was first starting out looking at the distro kid, the dittos, the CD baby, ease of use and sign up and making it easy as possible was like the most important thing to me as an artist and then away from that I think like one of the strengths of being independent and using um, distributors is the dashboard and the statistics that we get like it blows my mind it's fascinating I could put out an album back two weeks ago and I could see what country people are listening to, what platforms are giving me the most streams how long they're listening for, what playlist, then it's all on one dashboard. Um, so do, you like me, that? Do, you like, do you like them stats? Yeah, I love it because I just think as independent artists, we have to try and see ourselves as businesses. I know everyone wants to like, be a millionaire from music and that kind of stuff, but if you can earn 10 grand from music in a year, that's sick, do you know what I'm saying? That's like a two day a week job if you can earn 20 grand, 30 grand. And I think when you break it like, down like that and you look at the stats, like, this song's performing better than the other songs. I'll do some like TikTok stuff around this, but this song, you know what I'm saying? You can get to see where the peaks are yeah. and really zone in on those rather than just, all right, I've dropped the music on. I've dropped the music now, let me move on. The stats are everything for me, man. Okay, you know what? We're gonna, I'm gonna, I want to know more about what you've looked for because you've moved distributors, so I want to know why you moved them past. But I'm intrigued, like, what's, give us some interesting stats you've had about okay. your project, the recent one, so far. Anything that's been surprising? So, my thing is, DSPs are important but sometimes they're not an accurate reflection of your fan base. And if I want to go on a tour, which I did, 
I need to know what cities I can go and that people are going to turn up. So, for example, there's a song on the album that streamed loads on Spotify, yeah? It was like the number one streaming song. But it's not an accurate reflection of the most popular song. Because, because streaming that well because it got put into a playlist, yeah? Yep. So I went to Apple Music. I didn't get as much playlist support and I saw what songs people are actually messing with. So I'm like, hey, that's more organic, that's more authentic. And these people from this area of the country are listening to this song, so I'll do that, I'll make that the single. Um, so I think sometimes Spotify is great, it's like the number one most um, people are on it and that kind of stuff, but it can, like... Um, the playlist thing can skew. The playlist the thing can skew. I wish, I don't know if you can make this happen, bro, yeah? I think you'll you come over, You'll come over to Ditto if you yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Like, if you can make this happen, they should offer stats with playlist support and then stats without the playlist support so you can see like, what truly organic listenership you're getting and what people are gravitating towards. Because I think sometimes, like, if I get into a gym playlist, for example, it would tell me 40% of my monthly listeners are from Bangkok, but it just might be there's loads of Bang people in Bangkok that like that playlist, do you yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Um, but the stats are everything for me. I think that's the strength of distribution. I don't know if everyone's got like, those sick dashboards across the board, but that has got a great one. Distro Kid is okay. CD Baby is okay. And then as you move up to like the um, label services, they get more and more detailed, which is good. You might disagree, but <laughs> <laughs> so you you moved distribution. Okay, so what made you like at the beginning? You were saying I was just happy to just be able to do it, and it was just it, yeah. it was simple. But what has what has led you to to move through that? I think as my career and my following grew, I needed more value from a distributor um, and also I needed slightly quicker responses so I might put something up and then for example West Ham's a good a good example I do a lot of like football work we won the Europa I wanted to get a track on iTunes the next day if I'm going through a standard service on a distributor I might not be able to make that happen um, I think with iTunes it's quite good but with the rest of the DSP it takes a while because I'm with um, label services, they maybe have like a direct line into all the DSPs. So I was able to get a track across all DSPs up within 24 hours. Value like that is... That was a phone call, yeah? Me. Yeah, it's the email, is a phone call. Um, did, that, and did anything change as well when you had... Because you've won a couple of awards. Yeah. Yeah, you see, I love how you <laughs> say that like that. Yeah. But did that, has that, did that change? Did different distributors come out the world work when you had pro, profile moments like that? They respond to your emails quicker. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't say they all come out the woodwork, because as we said, what, there's 50,000 songs a day, yeah. there's loads of artists they can be looking at. Um, I will give them credit, though. I do think distribution and label services brought back like real artists and development, and they will take more of a risk on an artist, even if the numbers aren't there. But I think anything that goes well in your career, any peaks, any like jumps, any awards, that kind of stuff, put it in your bio straight away and let people know about it, because and then send shorter emails, man. I used to send paragraphs, and people were not reading those paragraphs, but start with, like, the big headlines, and people will reply, man. Six lines over. Yeah, man. I think anything else is attachment. <laughs> anything that goes over six, li six, 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 six lines is... Oh, I can tell stories, man. I'm, I'm terrible. No, you're good. <laughs> Am I good? You send messages to oh. me like Texas. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I... Yeah, I do put a personal touch in. I've got better. I've got better. Just here. going on, on dis distributors, by the way, I've got to give Mike credit, because one of the reasons why... I think we, because I'm, I'm the most cynical person about the music industry in so many different ways. Mike just replies, and I, I think that might be the artist in you, but you, you, uh, you, the human side, and I say this about Ditto to a lot of people when they ask where did you go, I always go, maybe start with Ditto and see how, how because I feel like there's humans there, which I think, I think, like you said, I think it's so important. Yeah, what you said is right. There's so many people that I've met at distribution and label service companies that are artists themselves or have been artists and I think that gives them more empathy towards people that are coming up and so you're more likely to get a response for sure, man. Yeah? Um, what do you think of, uh, of TikTok and TuneCore do? I mean, what do you, you know, were they, were they free for people to put stuff up and uh, Yeah, um, I, I've, stopped, to, I've stopped being worried about stuff like that. I, I remember like all the preferred part and stuff as well with Spotify. And, you know, there's always like oh, the praise and distro gets a little bit more than you know. You know, where's the data look kind of thing? You know, there is a process that goes on why why that is as well um, between their deals. Um, but yeah, I mean, 
whatever's good for the artist. I mean, I, I, I'm personally not here to say, I just want all artists on Ditto because that's good for me and it's good for Ditto. It's what's good for the artist. If there's opportunities to develop between uh, a distributor and TikTok and that's, got, that's helpful for artists, cool. You know, we're, we're doing our thing, we're doing Oculus and moving into, uh, you know, blockchain and crypto and, you know, doing MFTs. We're, we're thinking of new things, you know what I mean? So it's just like TikTok, I think everyone's still a little bit worried about it, but I, I think, you know, Spotify have got their reaction to TikTok. With, with, with what they'll be doing over the next six to 12 months, they're going to be doing, you know, you upload, um, you know, short video content to, to market and promote your release, just like TikTok, you know, they're, they're not trying to take TikTok on, but you know the importance of video and visual, so, yeah. yeah. Any any other questions? No, okay. Um, Another thing I was going to yeah. say is, um, in terms of what made me move around and that kind of stuff, I think you always got to try and look for the individual at an organisation that shows the most interest and passion for you as an artist um, and your music. Because there was a time in my career where I was like, you know, like when Stormzy was killing it, I'm like, who does Stormzy's PR? Who does his radio plug -in? That's who I want. And then I went for them and I realised you're not a priority to them. Just because they work with the bigger artists and flavour of the month, all that kind of stuff, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be right for your project. And I think question to us when it comes to the distributor or label services is forget like who's the biggest or who's the coolest at the moment or even like who's the cheapest like who believes in my music the most I'm gonna go there man and I've always found that pays off nice nice 100%. Um, I'm gonna ask you from your perspective so we know the process the boring but vital process in terms of what artists have to do for distribution but like even going with a bit of a campaign <coughs> head-on like when do you, you know, when do you upload? When do you tell people it's up there? When do you share your, like, what is that process from your perspective as a, a, a right owner and an artist? Yeah, I guess what I used to think was as an artist, my job is just to create the music. As soon as the music's finished, I want people to hear it. As soon I would have been possible. scared to meet younger you, you know, you sound like <laughs> you were hard work then, yeah? No, I you were like, man. I want Stormzy's yeah. PR person. <laughs> I was hard work, man. Was just, <laughs> you, know, you know how us artists can get, man. Um, but I think the great thing about when distributors say, we need at least four weeks notice, even that's frustrating, you're like, nah, people need to hear it today. It gives you time to really think about how to maximize your release. So in that four weeks while I'm twiddling my thumbs waiting, I'm thinking, this is what I'm gonna do on social media the first week of release. I'm thinking, this is what I'm gonna email to let the let know the tracks out, even if I can't afford the radio plugger, these are the emails I'm going to get, I'm going to send them out myself and that kind of stuff. And I think, I think in, I'm like an album artist, I'm not really a singles artist, but I think, right, album's going to come out end of the year, working backwards, I'm going to drop a single every six weeks for each single, this is what I'm going to do around the single. And you start to think in campaign mode, rather And then you realise you probably haven't got as much time as you think, because yeah, it is. Or it's, money. It's, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it goes quickly, man. No, but can you talk, okay, well, on that, because I think your campaign was one of the most interesting and disruptive, and when I say disruptive, you know how we all are, we get so much stuff sent, put in front of us that you, someone might say, I've got a single coming out, and you might see it on your feed or whatever, and then you kind of forget about it. And then if they don't say it again, like they may feel like, I've told everyone, yeah. I've told my 20,000 followers, but it might take five or six, there's actually maps around behind this, but like five or six times of them repeating that same message, maybe in different ways, but repeating it. And that might take you, if you want to do it respectfully, that might take you two or three weeks to do it, yeah. to get that information. And what I felt you done, and I'll come to your question definitely in a sec, what I thought you done really well is built this, I, I, I don't know how long it was since you first put up, I think it was like, was it like, did you start off with the? January, I think the first yeah, thing Yeah, but was. did you start off with the, the police, the, yeah, the voice yeah. note thing yeah, to yeah. say about the incident? Yeah. So to me, you're saying, well, so say six months ago. Yeah. And I just thought it was quite, because straight away, and I thought the way you went in was interesting. And then when you did come with a, I don't even think you mentioned when the album was coming out for a while. I think you were very smart yeah. and kind of sending people to the next step, next stage. Yeah. And even with all the stuff when you've done the exhibition and installation, and that, I thought that come at a point when, as a consumer of seeing enough of this messaging, you were ready to, to even think about this other thing. It wasn't all at once. So like, mm. yeah, can you, sorry, can you just talk about how you built that? And was it planned or was it you just getting to the next stage and then working out how you keep going? No, it was definitely, definitely planned. There's obviously some stuff that's reactive 
But I guess the, the two questions that I asked myself at the start was, there's so much music out there. How am I going to get people's attention? How many different ways can I think of to say the same thing, which is basically buy my album? Um, and then the second thing is, I think it's gone out of my mind, but yeah, man, I just wanted to find those different ways to tell people that the album was coming. Um, I went quiet for a bit on social media and then I put out like a, a voice note um, of an incident that happened that got people's attention and then I fed out some music, waited for that to chill a bit, fed out some different music and pulled out the themes from the music and tried to do different things. So we had a song about the education system, drove to my old head teacher's house, interviewed her. So I really like really like, could be tied all. <laughs> 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 it sounds so great yeah, the way you said yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but I just tried to find different access points for people, some people that might not even like the tune, but like the fact that I'm speaking to my head teacher, and then that's their access point into what I'm doing, so... Yeah, and and, and, and sorry, just a quick, how did, with your distributor, because you're, you've got, you're, a label, you're on a label service situation, was that plan communicated to them so they knew what you were doing around releases, and did you feed it into Spotify for art to say I'm doing this, and I'm like, you know, you got because I know you got your billboard Spotify or YouTube, someone yeah. give you a billboard, and yeah. so like, were you constantly telling them about yeah. what was going on? Yeah, I would say if you get the opportunity to do label services, go into the building, sit face to face, and don't just play on the music, but think of your own ideas. Oftentimes they'll have ideas of their own, but you inspire each other and I think they get excited. So I was like, one thing I want to do with this album is not care about the numbers. I want to get out there. If I put on an exhibition for people to come and find out more about it and 10 people come up, it's still worth it because that's 10 people that mess with my music and they were like, oh yeah, exhibition sick, we should do this and do this and think of that. We can sit behind the computer. I bet, they were, like, great. I bet they were like, we need numbers still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, they do. But even that, man, like you work it out. Go for a deal that you know you will like recoup. Like, it's comfortable for both sides and that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I'd say face to face as much as possible. Um, email's great, it's quick, but for uh, significant campaigns and that, you want to get in front of people. Right? Cool. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about um, sort of like posting on social media, like what's too much, what is too little. Because the thing is, I've found that if you post too much, it gets annoying, and then the algorithm is squishing your content. And if you post too little, then no one's seeing it. So it's kind of like your qu question would be for yourself and anybody really. Yeah. What's the good medium? Like? It's a good question. I actually think that your audience will tell you. You'll start to learn what they respond to. And so on Instagram, I don't actually post that often. And most of the stuff I post is music based because on Instagram, people seem to respond quite well to that freestyles and music stuff. On Twitter, no one gives a shit about my music, <laughs> yeah, but they love that I'm a West Ham fan and I'll tweet a bit about football and when I do tweet about music, a few of them will check it out, oh yeah, that was sick, that was a sick tune, you know what I mean? On TikTok, they don't care about football, but they love seeing that like, my kids for some reason, yeah, so I'll put out family content, but the bed of music that I'll use will be my own music and so, yeah, I think you'll find out what your audience respond to and if they're responding to something, do more of that and yeah. find different <coughs> ways to do it rather than my single, buy my single, buy my single, buy my single, buy my single because I think that it just get lost, man. So I think, I, I, sorry, I think that's the key of what you're saying is it's, yeah. your message may be the same, but it's how you say it. So I think people turn off if they see the same piece of artwork yeah. mostly because they'll assume they're seeing the same thing again. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll wash it out of the brain. Now if it's same piece of artwork, different record, or you know, they like, or even even the choice of artwork. I thought your thing with the eye, with the dash, yeah. I think it's one of the most impactful pieces of artwork. So the first time you've seen it, it sticks in your head. Then yeah. I don't think you, I don't know if you come back to it for a while, but what what you, you get a sense of, you've seen it it's in the back of your head, so you you're interested in more within that yeah. frame of of reference or that content. But I, I do think it's it's when you post the same thing or you're always asking mm -hmm. people. Whenever there's a, always a call to action, I think that's where the problem lies sometimes. Yeah. Put your stuff with your son was genius in the car, yeah. singing on the way to school. Or yeah, whatever, you know, but it's a way to grab people's yeah. attention. Yeah. Yeah. I even done, even with the art cover stuff, I did like an alternative cover that my son drew just because I wanted to say about my album, but people had seen the cover for like four months, so just chucking something different in there. It's helpful, man. But I, I genuinely believe your audience tells you, man. And understanding what kind of artist you are, because you've got like a Dave 
who might post like once every like three months. People love it. And then you've got other artists that people love seeing like every day, you know what I mean? So, yeah, man. Yeah, I'm just going to ask, because um, you guys have told us a lot about what helps the release, man. So then what actively hurts the release from both artists and artists and the Go from you, Mike. Come on, you've got a lot of list of this. Great question. Uh, it's a very, very good question. I, I think it's always a bit of discovery as well, particularly when you start now. You don't really know yet what's going to be helpful and what's not going to be helpful. You have to go through those processes. So that, that answer could be maybe different every time. Like we just said about like posting too much or too little, it's kind of finding them frequencies. Um, it could be you're talking about budget, you put too much money into press, where it's like maybe, you know. Again, you, you, you're low on the priority ladder, it's not the right time to be putting that, that amount of budget at press. And there's a lot that you can be do or, doing organically. Um, in terms of streaming, uh, I think it could be like how, how often do you release? Maybe you put too much content out, maybe it's saturating the, the, the small growing fan base you have, or maybe you need to increase it. I'm like avoiding your question completely. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I think, I, I, I don't know whether you'd agree with that. I think it's a bit about discovery, uh, isn't it? Particularly at first. Yeah, I would 100%. Um, the only thing I'd add, and this is hard for us. Okay, because you want to kind of try and rise above the noise. But I think what hurts the release is in authenticity, if that's a word, and doing stuff you know you shouldn't be doing. So like paying someone dodgy to push you up on the playlist or whatever. I think it just doesn't do any good. It's not great for you. It doesn't result in like real fans, and that's what you're trying to build at the end of the day. So I think just the real <coughs> one is. What about what about even things like you put a record out, you get a bit of buzz, dropping your whole project straight after that buzz, and maybe not extending it or building it. What about doing too many singles to the time your album actually comes? Like, are these things that you see where yeah, people mean, like killed off the fan base because it's like six <laughs> singles and the album comes out and then by then everyone and it's only two more tracks on the album that they know. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. try to respect what. No, what come on, Mike, come on, because I'm, I'm, I'm sick of this. I made you We've speak on records. Right? Come on, let's <laughs> <just, laughs> <I'm just laughs> Are you sticking to other lists? They've all got egos, right? It's just like, I, I, it's time my album is genius. I want it out there, I want everyone to hear it. It's too early, an album's a machine, you know, it's like, it, 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 it should what, be... What you want to say is no one cares, is that what you... No, it, sometimes it, people it, don't but care. It depends on what you want out of it, that's the first question to ask yourself, right? So if you just want, you, you're thinking, I know this isn't going to stream well, but yeah, I don't care, my, my goal for this is I just want to have music out there, and if family and friends listen to it, great, and beyond, so that's a bonus, great. If you're taking it seriously, then, you know, you maybe you just need to consider, what well, how are you going to get to that project? Well, not to say that it's too early, but, you know, but then if you're thinking, like, if you're, t you're going Mike, to... Can I ask him a question? I am. No. I've got, I've got <laughs> Have you ever been... <laughs> oh, what I wanted to say is, or what I really want you to say is, you've, had, you've seen projects, this is what I wanted to say, where you go, you put the album out and nobody cares, and then we told them if we can see the stats. Yeah, and I've, and got, I've got mates here, Mike, I've put my album out on Friday. It's your first release? Yeah, man, it's exciting, isn't it? It's just like, man, are you sure? <laughs> and then it comes out, we're like, Mike, use this, and we've not on any playlists. How come we haven't got, um, so you know, how do we get streams? Would you always like, say though, uh, would you advise, and then it's up to them to go against your advice? Yeah, or? yeah exactly, you know, but sometimes they tell me. Yeah, they still, as well, they still probably blame you. <laughs> I've got a question though. Have you ever been surprised? So someone's you know, uploaded their album single, you've been like, oh, the way they've done that, it's never going to work, but it's just blown up. Oh, there's been a few times. And even like Spotify for artists with the pitch until like, you meant to leave five, you can't pitch a week before, uh, less than a week before, so it's got to be like in advance and have a week spare, otherwise Spotify will look at it. And then there's, the, you know, we advise people and something's happened and it's got playlisted or it, everything that you've just said to that person, they're like, they're full of BS because like, that's not what's happened. And sometimes it's a bit like, you can only give, you know, what we understand, what we know. But these, these anomalies do happen, but yeah, sometimes organically something just pops and no one can see the colour of the artist. See, they knew all along, they knew this was going to happen for them. Um, but yeah, all you can do is give your advice. And in the music business, I, I, most of the time, not everybody's right. Nobody can be right. All you can do is give your, your opinion. And if the opinion of yourself, like a label service or press or radio and the artist, if everyone's on the same page and you've got a good team, you get a good plot together and you go for it. And Sorry, say what you was going to say about, like, he was on a track of, like, okay, we've got this project coming and then you was just like, um, single of their projects and everything. He was about to say something and then kind of whatever. 
Yeah, no, I, was, yeah I, I suppose what I was getting at it, I was ready to go into campaign I've never been like so nice. we turn the cameras off, because if we turn the cameras off, you might actually go leave. <laughs> but again, I used to say he was right, he was wrong. No, if, if I've got like a friend and like, or, or, or a customer or whatever, and they're like, well, he's a project, I want to get out, what's, what's the best way? I mean, for me, if you're going to build an audience, mm -hmm. To drop an EP project, try waterfall building it. You've got lots of content coming through. Build the algorithms up. Honestly, I've seen I've done two ways of doing it. Where we've done a waterfall recently with a new artist, brand new profile. Who was in another, who was in another band who was doing well. Started again, and I thought, okay, with the music's exceptional, brilliant team. Let's give it a go on legal service. We did a waterfall build of a, I think a, a six track EP. It was literally single one, single two, single three, single four. The algorithms went to the listeners were up to like sixty. 60,000, I think we achieved like 80,000 to 90,000 streams over six weeks, which is, I know not the biggest streaming in the world, but it, it was great That's progress off the bat. Yeah. Uh, where other, the other way is like the traditional single one, single two, maybe then drop the EP, focus track. But what's so important around single one, single two, or a radio campaign, a video content, press, uh, digital marketing around those two. So. Again, it depends on what's happening around, but I think if your focus and your goal is streaming numbers and building fan base on socials, I think a nice little waterfall is a great way to, to build, which is what I was probably going to say. Then. In, terms of dis in terms of distribution, did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. In terms of distribution, two, two questions. Don't, don't cut your eye. This is where he's like, please don't do this to me. One is, you know those things we talk about, radio, <coughs> PR, touring, and you mentioned it must be in pop the plot, and if the plot's correct, drive streams and you know. What, how would you rank the importance? I know each artist has a slightly different one, but where do you rank things without annoying anyone, any organisation or that you might not want to? In terms of marketing or and promotion industry, around a, it. a part of the sector. Yeah, but like, what do you, do, you, do you think, do people put too much emphasis on radio when it doesn't actually impact sales or streams as yeah, much do, do people you know completely i mean think radio as well people think right so the solution here is to maybe it's a mistake question as well like i'll hire a plugger because then that then i'll get on video so that's you know brand new artist to pay someone else you know maybe maybe by chance they do you know but there's a lot that you can do with bbc introduction you don't need that and, and you're going through again the right organic way of doing things as streaming, you could say the same and uh, get a tutorial and just build it up as long as it's growing. It doesn't matter how many streams you're doing, you're making progress. Um, with press, again, I'm at the realisation at the moment, and it's with press. I don't run the press very highly at the minute. If you're thinking about investment and money, what's the monetization between £3,000 you're paying for a press campaign? You get Clash Magazine, best case scenario. How is that reflecting back onto your streaming numbers? How are you benefiting financially from that? Profile-wise, opportunities. It's a good look and it's a good like driver for me and the label service to go to Spotify and go, hey, nice feature coming up on Clash Magazine. But once that's been done, the value is gone. Well, just what I was about to say, so yeah, is there a lot of falsehoods? I disagree with that. Oh, no, okay, go on. But I, I get you it from your perspective. You call your woman a man. I get it from your, from your perspective, though, but I think from an artist's perspective, there's so many different kinds of artists. So you might have, like, a Lil Kana, for example. Well, he'll get six music, but he won't be on, like, Radio 1 all day, every day. But he'll be able to sell, like, 10,000 But do you think, do you, do, you, do you think, this is what I'm going to ask, do you think his six music play... Okay, I'm, I'm talking about, like, how you put together your plot and yeah. how important the way you distribute your, your resource. Not distribute, distribute, but, like, the way you allocate your resource. So... Do you think the six music play leads to more streams, or do you think it just helps build a picture? And that's what yeah, I'm happy about. Yeah, it, yeah. it contributes to more streams. What's stream, the thing that you think for you yeah. is the thing? Like, is it the live show you do at the venue, the eight hundred cap venue in London, yeah. or is it? For me, it is getting a play by a song on extra. Like, what yeah. is it that you you? And then what would you see? The thing that gives me the most response is probably like a one extra thing or a PR, like a good news story because of the nature of the album. But for someone else, it might be um, like a photo shoot, yep. a clash, because that means they'll get 10 grand brand or whatever off the back of that. So as an artist, you have to look at the holistic picture. And then where it comes back in, because the photo yeah. shoot, for instance, when you said they get 10 grand from a brand, yeah. it doesn't necessarily give them more streams, no, but it, it gives them money in the bank. So, so it contributes yeah, to the music, yeah. you know what I'm saying? So it all works together in a way. And then my I second think. question then, I had two. The second one was. 
Do you think artists, and you can come in on this, do you think artists sometimes chase these things, like when they look at distribution of Spotify playlists and Apple playlists and Tidal playlists, and I'm just trying to think, I'm trying to be fair, YouTube music playlists, if you have playlists, I think you do. Um, do you think they, they don't see it as maybe the way you're talking about, you're talking about building an audience to the point where it can become sustainable? Do you think sometimes people chase these things, not actually understanding the worth? Of them, and does that it, does that become a problem where people overspend on certain areas? Yeah, or like, well, I don't know about overspending, but definitely in terms of expectation. I mean, I try to keep that really in check because, you know, I, I think people get oh, maybe, maybe not as much now, but there was a time where playlist was so uh, vital for everyone. It's just like we don't want to put the work in. We just we want to get big. By getting big, that means the result of getting in the playlist. How come you didn't make that possible? So we give you a single, and, and we've pitched it. Spotify haven't. Uh, playlisted it so automatically we've done a bad job and, they're, and they're, they're feeling disappointed so when we go in it's very much like well it's early days we're feeding a narrative to Spotify and Apple and we may be doing the same with radio we've got extra whatever just because you don't get them results right away come single two or single three there's progress there they're aware of you they're across what you're doing so it doesn't mean that it's a closed door immediately but when those artists are like at that that very uh, but maybe the first or second singles are like already getting like disappointed that they're not getting what they want, uh, then I think that mindset needs to change where editorial at Spotify or Apple or any of the others is to amplify the organic fan base. It's the organic fan base that the artists need to concentrate on. And if you're happy that you've got a good team taking care of those conversations at DSPs and that's being stoked every release and those narratives are there, then you're in a good position. Um, budget, well, that, that's, an, that's another conversation completely. Uh, I suppose you sometimes you have to spend a little to know how that works. So there's just got to be some real honest conversations with the artist about expectations, but also how they believe they're going to actually build a fan base. Do you, and, and do you think that, because again, I, I've been part of campaigns where the artist will be looking at the distributor or whoever else and like, or the plugger or whatever, and why has that not worked? And I've had the luxury to work with third parties on pro who've come back and said, well, that's the artist, what, what are they doing mm, to build yeah. their fan base? Because they're not even posting about the record, they're just waiting for the good news. Though, no, so. completely. And I, I, I've had these conversations with big music managers who represent some of the biggest artists, honestly. And when they work with a new artist, they, their expectations sometimes is immediately, because I, I work with this brand new artist, we need you to get them on playlists. That's what we're asking you to do. It's just like... It doesn't matter if you're representing this artist or not, the situation's exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll feed in that they're represented by your management company, because that, that's a good look, but that's not going to automatically be sold and you get a playlist for this artist. And, and interestingly enough, the people on the other side, you, you, me, whoever, if we if there's not a buzz about the artist, we're probably not going to find them. Yeah. Do, you, do, you, do you get what I'm saying? So it's like, you, you realise, like, it's only so much the distributor can control <coughs> in oh, terms yeah. of... And we shouldn't control it all to team play. To you. We'll go there and then go to you. And then anyone else got questions? You can't sit here and be here and not ask questions. It's rude. Uh, so yeah, my uh, question would be, what's your opinion on third party websites like Submit Hub and Groover who offer like uh, independent artists the opportunity to submit <laughs> to those playlists that you mentioned earlier, those third party playlists? Well, you've heard what, from, from the, literally from a horse's mouth, what the, the global head of independent Spotify said to me said at our conference that we don't like people paying for it. Um, I think it can, I think sometimes there's digital marketing companies that see it as a way to accelerate algorithms by getting you in these playlists, which ultimately will lead to maybe, you know, you're getting into algorithmical uh, official Spotify playlists or, you know, maybe attract the attention of editorials. But ideally, again, I refer back to the organic, it's something to build. Uh, um, but we've had situations with artists of use from it up. They don't know the ins and outs of the, the playlist that they're getting thrown at. And some of them have had fake streaming in there and they've had the music team on Spotify. This is happening. Right, okay. And they, so they, you know, they may go, oh, I, I had no idea, I'm so sorry. That's not going to change Spotify's mind. And it'll probably blacklist you for future opportunities. So, not to scare anyone. Yeah, and so you, would you say the best way then is to go through your district? I think you should cover that base 100%, okay. particularly if there's a, you know, try and reach out, find out, again, if there's someone, build a relationship with someone at a distribution company, you know, get advice from them, keep in touch with them. I'm not saying something, 100% don't do it, but there are, I think there are risks, and I'm only going off what 
you know, as I say, someone at the and Spotify sent them to us. So, uh, but you know, not to say that anyone who's ever used some of almost had success and you know, building things as well. To you know, it's a bit of a uh, tricky landscape. Governor, do you cool, use you. these these various of oh, like uh, summer yeah. hubs, etc., to send music around? No, not. But I come from like the hood, so I, I'm just like <laughs> I don't trust people easily, man. Sometimes this stuff seems too good to be true. I always think it probably is, but everyone knows you need a distributor to get your music on DSP. So I always prefer to go the official route. But I say there's no reason you can't hustle, man. Like I can't lie, I've been on LinkedIn, typed in the company name and followed every person that works at a distributor on Instagram, got their email address and emailed them direct just to let you know I'm doing this or whatever. I think Submit Hub and that kind of stuff, I get the attraction, but sometimes it can result in us that being lazy. I'm saying try and find other ways to, to cut through, cool. would be my advice personally. But. <coughs> Truth's in the pond though, hey, <laughs> you made it way yourself, and then we'll go to you. So when you release an album, it comes out, everyone hears it, you make the bank. How long of a break do you think you should give yourself before working on the next one? I know what Spotify was. What about, what about from Mike the creator or Mike the manager? What, what's your, should artists always be on recording and making music or do you need to be in for a moment? Is it to release another album or just to release more music? Just, just your music in general. I think it's good if you've had such a big campaign, I think I think taking a little bit of a step back sometimes is a good thing to do because I think when you come back with a new project, it's, really good. it's mm. refreshing. You can be scared on your socials and come up with a new, from a creative point of view as well. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't leave it too long either. I think if you've had a moment where you're having some success and building, maybe change the focus as well. Yeah, you've just put an arm on the focus for now is live and merch for a bit, but you know in the background that you know give it two or three months you're going to be dropping a new digital single and yep. going back to that pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I wouldn't leave it too long. I think. I don't know what you're doing three what, what would Spotify say out of interest in terms of the gut? Well, they, they just want you to release music as regularly as possible. They're saying, well, every six weeks, maybe, a couple of months at least. Um, do, you think that's, do you think that's realistic? No, I, I, I'm, I'm on the fence with it. I, I see, I think in a campaign, yeah, I get that. And you may have a long-term plan. We're like 12 months, we're going to drop a single every. But also, that's, this is not a music... This is not Spotify saying it from a music quality standpoint, it's saying it from a we're a platform yeah. like yeah, like 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 uh, Netflix. They, Netflix just want more content because yeah. you have more content people. Yeah. So, they, so they're saying it will keep your fans in check, but it'll keep them on our platform as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so so it's more of a if you want to maximize what we have here, you should release regularly. Yeah. That's more the thing they're saying. They're not saying artists oh, should be making enough music to release every six weeks. They're not actually saying, it's not, a, it's not a creation conversation, it's more of a, if you want to utilize our service. Yeah, yeah. No, 100%, 100%. But if your game plan is a, it's got a physical product and there's a, there's a longer, there's a longer map there, you know, um, then everyone wins, you know what I mean? I think, particularly kind of, um, how, did, how was it with physical? Yeah, what? it was good, good um, loads of vinyls. CDs, but I think it's for core fans, and it was because yeah. I was touring as well. Because in reality, no one's playing a CD these days. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, like yeah. to have a keepsake. But if you've got physicals, I'll drag out the campaign a little bit. Uh, I was gonna say the positive from putting out music all the time and singles is you've got more music out there. But I think sometimes as the artist, the negative can be you don't like squeeze all the juice out of the song that you've already got. You move on too quickly when actually, if you stuck on it a few more weeks, you could have got more good stuff out of it. So I think the danger with the consistent thing is just always moving on, but yeah. you worked hard on the song, like, um, just focus on it a bit longer and make sure that people yeah. get what they can out of it, do you know what I mean? Another question to you, and, I, and then I'll come to you. Definitely gonna come to you. <laughs> <laughs> do you, um, do you stockpile? So like, do you only start a campaign for a project, for <coughs> our art, a sort of project art? Do you only, when you complete it? So like, when you start, when, in January, when you said about the project, was it done, was it mixed mastered? Was it in the system? Yeah, it was only done because Virgin, who are my label services company, would only start a campaign when oh, I had yeah. the you know, right? I think we might probably tell you, probably had a lot of bad experience. People saying it's done, it's done, it's not ready or whatever. But when I was with um, just your standard distribution, there were loads of times that I'd started the campaign without having it finished. But that put myself under pressure. Mm. I think to have patience as an artist is difficult. Like, it always pays off. Like, but I think it comes off you when you. 
that because I, I, I assume yeah. that you had it done yeah, because yeah. they felt like there was a conviction mm. in in the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it probably gives you more options to be able to okay, you know what, actually, it might be this single next round. Yeah. Like, if it's all done and it's in, you can have more of an extensive plan. Yeah. For sure, man. Um, and it also it still gives you the freedom to be reactive. So yeah. if the first single popped off more than we thought it would, we can just hold it for a bit. Um, but I would advise it, even though it's hard. That answer your question, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so my question is... Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll uh, yeah. How, how long do you think that these group curated and focused playing circles will, will last for? In terms of editorial? In terms of, like, the good effect on radio play from Spotify. It's, all, it's hard, it's hard it's I mean... Spotify punishes it for us. Yeah, I mean, AI's got to change a lot, isn't it? Start. I mean, tell us, tell us what, how, what, what your thoughts. Because you're in, you're in that, you're in that inner circle. You're in Illuminati and all that. You you do, you do get the sense that the end game for a lot of tech companies is that you know they don't want any human beings making decisions. It's going to be a lot of AI based stuff. And Spotify have been using AI for quite a while anyway, so that's only kind of going to grow. So will they need human beings to make editorial decisions? I mean, you'd think yes, because it's super important, but you know, we're, we're going to get to that point. And then, you know, coming to radio as well, you know, it's just like the impact from, you know, one over to radio. It, it, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to see where it's going to go at the minute, you know. I, I'd like to, the, the humanity needs to persevere and keep that relevance, and I think finding the value in AI and... Do you think there's a place for everything, though? Because I assume, like, when you think about radio, Coming off the back of maybe streaming being an indicator for what them for what people like, but then you have radio, especially BBC, where the, it's more about the personality of the um, presenter mm -hmm. than sells yeah. that artist. Yeah. And then you get BBC interesting thing where it's done from like a grassroots level to a, like those things are very human based. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Even yeah. if streaming becomes more AI based, do you think? It's a role for everything with it. Music's relatable, yeah. It's about communities and it's about um, you know what resonates with us. I think the humanity is the most important aspect of that to, to retain that in the right way. But embracing the usefulness of AI, that's what needs to be. Because if you had more AI in Ditto, you might be able to go and do more of the personal touch on certain projects. Yeah. If there was no, exactly, yeah. Yeah. you integrate it in a positive way. Do you reply to your emails or you got a bot doing it? No, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I've encountered I'm someone who used to work for Ditto who's starting to like not attend meetings and you have a bot just listening and makes an automatic Really? Yeah. No way. Yeah. That's I, I had this email, so I was just going to say this, I forget what the name is, I, but I stopped it because it was a bit weird. But um, you could press the button, and read the email, it would summarise it and yeah. suggest a response. No. And I was like, nah, this is a bit weird. And, and they would miss the trick sometimes, so you realise the calm thing, but it. It was, and the whole point of it was meant to cut down the, the, the amount of thinking you've got to do. But I then thought, I'll start replying to things that I haven't even really thought about and digest it because I'm not actually reading it. Because everyone does that in different way, don't we? Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, that, that's an important question, that email. I'm going to come on, I'm going to chew on that, I'll come back to that tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. So it's, 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 it's interesting, but it's saving time, the idea that you have more time to do the important stuff. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, so he yeah, talks for a living, yeah, he <laughs> talks for a living, so he's, he, this could be really deep. This could be so yeah, Governor, you know, you were touring, how much did that have an impact, like, you release music and then it's had an impact on the distribution, the stream, but just with a digital kind of marketing platform, yeah. but with the tour, how much did it really impact your streams and distribution, did it really make that big difference, or is it worth it to do that, or do you think it's better for artists to do that? 100% man, I think if you can get out in front of people, you should man. For me it made a massive difference, I think you separate maybe your more casual fans that might come across your music in a playlist or, or whatever, to people that would like buy a hard ticket, bring their friends to come and see you, their friends never seen you before or heard of you, now they're a fan, I'd, I'd say get out as much, and sometimes we... For me, I compare myself to artists and I don't think it's always a helpful thing. So if, you know, um, Central C announces a tour and he sells it out within 60 seconds, I'm like, what am I going to do like a 300 capacity venue for? Do you know what I mean? But I think we need to get out of that comparison and get to 50 people, set it out, six months later do 100, then do one, and just build and build and build and build and then that's your core audience. And then when you go to a distributor, 
they're not magicians. They can't just magic stuff out of nothing. I know artists that have had hundreds of brands poured into them on major labels and they still can't cut through. But you can say, I've got 500 people that would pay a hard ticket to come see me live. I, 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 but I still it. think, and you'll know this, that's still an actual measure. So even when they talk about some of the biggest artists who can't do numbers, especially when they go out of their local, mm -hmm. so like a lot of London artists yeah. who, were, who were big, can't do, say, Birmingham, can't yeah, do yeah. 300 in Birmingham, but can do 2,500. Yeah, so like like that's, that's who, who are literally selling 500 to 800 capacity venues who are pitching Spotify and they're just not, they're just not placed on playlists. It, it, it's mad. And then sometimes the reversal is there's artists doing millions of streams again on every playlist and they sell struggle to. selling 200 cap venue. You know, it, it's, so I think even like, um, even Jerry Cinnamon, people like that, who suddenly were doing like arena size, uh, you know, they, their streams still weren't equating to the level he was at live, you know, and mm. sometimes that balance is way off, but completely agree with the frequency, you know, it's start, start small and grow it, and they're there for And like squeeze out probably what you get out of that audience, even if it's yeah. always small, it's like... Yeah. You know what Mike was saying about it, music being human as well, yeah. there'll be tracks on my album that people slept on, and they've heard me do it live and they've connected in a completely mm -hmm. different way. Now it's one of their favourite tracks and they go back and they keep streaming it and that kind of stuff. So I think live is important, man. And I, I, it's probably the biggest ask of... Like, you all could be at home, no offence to people at home, you know, watching this. Right? You all could be at home watching this, but there's a different level of commitment to get up, mm -hmm. go out, go into a room and engage. Do you know what I mean? There's a deeper thing there. And I think if you can get people from... Like, it's very easy to stream. It's very easy to watch something once, listen to something once. It takes a lot more to go. And then once you do, if that experience is great, you'll probably remember it. Like, I, I can remember gigs going back 25 years. 25 yeah. years, I can remember. It's a gig that was, like, amazing. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You, and you probably, everyone probably does remember. So, the importance of it, and I know I go silly when I go to gigs elsewhere. <laughs> Merchandise and stuff. Oh, I went wait, to the Kendrick Lamar thing, it was great. I went with my stepdaughter and my son, and I probably spent £200 on merch. That's massive, though. Revenue stream, man. Like, buy a hoodie for £10, put your logo on it, sell it for 30 100 people. You're going home with a decent amount of money, man. Probably what's what's happening all, all these yeah. um, our campaigns at the minute? There's all these pop up ideas as well, where people are taking over shops, going on the tour. Mm -hmm. Could be 20 people turning up, 50 people. Or in stores where like you get a little performance and then sign the vinyl, CD, t shirts afterwards. You, you're meeting the artist, you've got a personal experience with the artist. That's, that's well more valuable than you know 300 people who are just going to come and see you and go immediately. You know, to that was the main way we, I got the number one album. I did in stores the week of the album release. I think on streaming alone, it wouldn't have done it, but the fact people are buying physicals, some of the vinyl, vinyl, a CD, and a cassette, it all adds up, man. So, yeah. How did you. How did you. Uh, that last man. The reason why I'm laughing is like, <laughs> no, because you know, I was thinking this through the week when, when you were doing it, I was like, this stuff's boss, what he's doing. I was like, how did you, how did you finance it? Um, so, <laughs> when I moved over to Label Services, they could see that based on my last three albums, I had made a certain amount. And they were willing to give me a marketing spend, they call it, of how X amount because they're fairly confident they're going to recoup that within three years. So, so you've say, proven that yeah. and they've invested into it to grow that? I yeah. Okay. And I think you still got to have the independent mindset of, okay, cool, I don't want to take too much or too little, I want to recoup. Because I always prefer getting paid monthly for my music anyway, rather than owing someone money and not getting How did you so get into shops? do all the things, you know, when you went to all the different, different shops, how did you get in? Were they just random shops or was it big, big, like HMDs or whatever? No, I don't know if this is like a Ditto Plus service yeah. as well, but as you move from like distributor to um, some of their more developed services or label services, they will have <coughs> their own deals with like Rough Trade, for example, where they can go to one person, they'll sort you out all the Rough Trades within the week or record stores up and down the country or whatever, so it was just my label that, that sorted it out. I think people are just like, people on teams, like, you know, like we've, we've done it, we did the two um, album campaign, we, we did the, the pop-ups all over the country, and I think it's just like, we just know the right contact, it can help, help us come on as a third party and come on board and arrange all that for the artist, um, and then it's all come together. Um, like Rough Trade stuff, like I know the Rough Trade team well, but if I wouldn't have known that, I wouldn't have been able to offer that to, you know, certain campaigns or artists that I work with. Um, 
So yeah, I think it's still back to that being in hosting times as well. Yeah, man. I think independence is a gift and a curse. I think the good thing is we're just used to doing stuff ourselves and making it happen. But the bad thing is we're not used to delegating and asking for help. And yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so I think where possible, it's not bad to say, yo, I want to do a rec uh, in store tour. You know, anyone can help me out. You know what I mean? So I had a question about um, label services because I'm kind of miss what the difference is between the distribution and, and the label <laughs> services. Yeah, so using this as an example, anyone, you know, apart from the quality control aspect, uh, the, you know, the quality of the music you're providing, anyone can do that, any level of artist. If it's something where either A, we discover that artist and we approach you, or you're doing some, it could be doing good numbers, or you're, you're getting some good spots on radio, you, you think it's a good time to have a conversation with the label service to take it to more of a, a client-based relationship, whereby rather than you pay £19 a year, we'll do either a commission split on royalties in return for like marketing services like pitching for playlists and radio, and digital marketing, campaign management. Um, uh, again, we do marketing advances attached as well, uh, if, if depending on the campaign, uh, with marketing drawdown funds and available marketing money, so you know we can achieve A, B, and C if we're comfortable or confident. We're going to recoup on that, but it's a case by case conversation. It's just like if you're like confident that like you know you're off the starting block, you get some, you know you've got a moment or there's something happening at the minute. You think it's, I need a team, I'm, I need to grow, take this from here to there. Then it's got to find out who that personal contact is. So it sits say. within the distributor. It, yeah, you know, I mean, it's just like another level. To yeah, the I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I don't like to say it like it's a high level. I mean, our bread and butter is distribution for everyone. It really is, but mm. but we have global success with label service on a huge level as well. Um, so it's just about sometimes it's, it's it, like I've I've done Vic Astley. I've done some mad random artists. Um, you know, <coughs> just come up with, uh, Ian Brown. I put his last two singles out. Um, you know, there's artists like that who are huge and the, the, the huge heritage acts. They just need to have that level of service. Then there's the other task of like growing uh, an artist and taking them from, yeah, some stuff's happening, but they need a team and they need to be taken to that next level. We can come in and do that. Um, but yeah, every conversation is different. So my advice is, you know, if you ditto, feel free to drop me an email with your music, by the way. Um, that, you know, have a conversation with the distributor, find out how their structure works and see if you can get some reactions on, on you. Music and your plan. What is your email? <laughs> <laughs> my, my Are we going live? <laughs> <laughs> live? Um, yeah. Can you not? Can yeah, you I'll, 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 I'll give it to BJ and BJ can. Uh, yeah, but anyone assume everyone is registered for this session, which is why you should have registered. The three easy steps. <laughs> three easy steps. <laughs> no, no, so if anyone can reach out on email, we'll pass it along and yeah, drop an email. Um, I've just got like, two, two questions. Why not just jack and just break it? <laughs> no, I came for a reason, Jack. There you go, come on. Now do you think, do you think? We've so, got about two minutes left, so if anyone else got a question, please get in line now. Um, two questions. You mentioned the waterfall um, critics. If you could just break down what that actually means. I understand yep. the second one you mentioned. Yep. Two, you know, I've got a friend here who's about to drop a music video tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So then, on a music video, yeah, I'm going to try Yeah, so then, on, on doing that, so I thought it would be your first step in like promoting a music video because obviously that's going to benefit their singing. Like, what's the best way or I don't know, So you can already start things? thinking about that one and like <laughs> your best of. Okay, mine's the boring one isn't it? Okay, well, I'll talk about <laughs> Okay, so Waterfall, uh, I'll, do, I'll do a three track EP example. Okay, so uh, single one, just like a one track single release, you'll be assigned an ISRC code, your track level code. Uh, if anyone doesn't know what that is, she, it's, I think it's a nine, is it a nine? Or eleven digit number. Uh, track level code, after you've released via Ditto for your sign it, you can log in and find out if you fall. When you do second single, you use the ISRC from that first single and have your first single as track two and your brand new single as track one. So if you imagine like a belt and wall here, so you've got single one and then your second single will be track one and single one will be track two on the second release. On the third release, again, you put your latest single as track one Single two would be track two, and single one would be track three. You use the same ISRC, so you're giving all the other tracks, previous singles, and other role advice. So basically, you're waterfalling the algorithms and streaming. So it, it really does kind of generate a lot of activity. 
So again, we've discussed the idea of moving on too quick and that the previous single not getting as much value. I guess in one, one respect, to a degree, it kind of gives those previous singles another look as well. So, so just so I understand, so if you've got like a three-track EP and everything, track number three actually then came out like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Track number two came out. I mean, we call it an EP, but I mean, ultimately, it depends on how you package the, the end the end game, the end product there. Uh, but ultimately, you say this is a three-track project and there are three releases. So track one, one track, track two, two tracks, track three, three tracks. I hope that makes sense. If not, again, the email we can launch later. Um, I think you said the video is out tomorrow, so it might be too late, but one thing I would definitely do is try and build a bit of a community on YouTube. I think a lot of artists sleep on it. So if you go on your YouTube app, they'll have like shorts, um, do live videos, and there's like a little community tab as well where you can speak to people and just try and build up your subscriber base, because whenever you upload, they'll get a notification that you've uploaded. Etc. Um, people probably don't speak about YouTube a lot in terms because they've got yeah. a team like almost like distribution where if you get to a certain point where you've got a certain amount of subscribers, your channel gets you, your channel will get managed, mm. which means obviously you can ma ma monetize it in a different way, but you can also get opportunities as well. Um, obviously, a lot of platforms like you to upload videos natively to their platform, so obviously it doesn't aggregate on YouTube, but that can actually be to your detriment if you want YouTube, and because they've got YouTube music as well, it's, it's a, Copy. that's massive, technical yeah, yeah, yeah. in its own way. It helps us from a pitching for label service as well, so video and audio, you know, editorial and marketing opportunities all the time, you know, again, on YouTube, we're huge billboards about the label services, and the team are fantastic. Who did you get your billboard from? Because YouTube do have some, was it, what, what was uh, it? Spotify, maybe. Spotify, yeah. give me a billboard, a guy called Sage at Spotify. Sage, Sage is a legend. Yeah, he's a good guy. Um, I wasn't expecting it or anything. The other thing I'd say before I... Were you actually not expecting it? No, nah, man. Because... And where was it again? Artists. It was in Leicester Square. Leicester Square, which is obviously massive for four. Yeah, no, nah, it was huge, man. Um, it was a big opportunity. Um, but the, another reason I wasn't expecting it is because Arlo Parks had an album out that week, so I just thought it was going to get a YouTube board, so we get everything. Um, but it was good. Um, the one thing I'll say is repurposing your video content in, and putting it up in short form or in like reels and TikTok. I was like an artist, I was like, I'm never going on TikTok, I'm not setting up an account, I hate it, it's going to ruin music, I'm not dancing to none of my tunes or anything like that. <laughs> um, but no, I love it. And yeah, I, I know artists that literally will post different clips of their song doing different stuff and that's what will help people kind of gravitate. I know the big one as well is like the branded, so if you're doing something on shorts, don't use the TikTok branded one. Yeah. And yeah. 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 Deep, deep, yeah. Deep. Very much don't like that. Don't they pick up on it so it, the algorithm stops it? Yeah, it's yeah, it's quite clever. What, what do you mean? So on, if you do a TikTok thing, it, it brands it TikTok, it yeah, watermarks yeah. it, doesn't it? Some people take that same video and try to upload it to YouTube Shorts what? with the TikTok brand. What? No, we'll that. <laughs> what I do, a little plug, is there's an people app. People do it though, do you know yeah, 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 I get it. Yeah, yeah. There's an app called Video Leap that I use and I'll export a video in Video Leap and then I'll just put that same video on Shorts, Reels, TikTok. You, you, and then I think we're, we're, we've got to end. So, yeah. Um, a technical one. So, from distro, if we get distro, which puts us into having Vivo accounts, how can we access Vivo accounts? I think it's one of them things, unfortunately. Uh, you, yeah, basically. you need to go through an aggregator like like uh, distro get uh, this out. Uh, so you, it, you need them to do your profile updates. So it's kind of, I guess kind of the way Vivo themselves explained it to me is that Vivo isn't like a, 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 a competitor of YouTube. It's just that it's, it's, it's an application that, that promotes and sources video content that can live on YouTube. So you know, it depends on kind of what your goal is there. But you can have a YouTube account, you can merge the two. So that could be one, one solution to that. But unfortunately you have to go to the industry. Do you understand Vivo? Because that's the one thing I will just never understand. Mm -hmm. What's what's the difference? Why do we need it? I think Vivo. Come on, come on, give us the proper answer. <laughs> <laughs> I know, uh, I, the the, the partners are the YouTube say with Vivo, so you got yeah, yeah. No, no, Vivo is great. I think I think there was a time where everyone just liked the prestige of the Vivo, you know, stamp on there, and I think you know it kind of made them artists feel a little bit more, you know, kind of on the level of big, bigger artists. But there's a lot more to it. Their marketing opportunities are brilliant. They really do get behind like up and coming artists. They've got 
a lot of great programs. Um, I think one's called Lift and one's called Discover. And, um, yeah, they're, they're always kind of looking for opportunities to help them develop the, the independent uh, the service. That's what I've got. Ben, just like the, 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 the information they gave you, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when it's going to be a lot of this conference, November 16th, at the O2, go to this on music socials, so information should be launched there today. I hear DJ's going to send everyone here if they want to go and put on a mini bus. Um, <laughs> Viva will be there and presenting hands on, but, uh, so it'll be the good one to a lot of those. <laughs> okay, uh, last, it was one last question, I believe. Yeah, so um, I think it kind of leaks into that you mentioned about merging the YouTube accounts, because I was thinking when. My song was released on YouTube. It went to I think it was like Topic. Yeah. Yeah, and I was just wondering how do you get that like sort of directly onto your channel straight away rather than. So it should be attached to the channel. So the Topic is usually because of the audio delivery that's come from your distributor. Okay. Um. So that's why it's just a static piece of the artwork. But the, it should it should assign that release to your artist to the Topic channel, which is linked to your video profile, your artist profile. That makes sense. So sometimes it doesn't map right. That's I don't, that's a, probably a process of speaking to YouTube about getting that lined up for you. Okay. But every artist profile on, on YouTube should have like a topic section to it with all your topic videos on there. That right, I'll have a look at that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So, time to wrap up. Um, does everyone feel better about distribution now? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Have you got FAQs on your, your website if you want to? Yeah. Is there improved? So if people will go to Ditto Music and want to find out and understand it more, you can go. This was not an advert for Ditto Music, but <laughs> I think Mike's a wonderful representative. Governor, what's coming up next for you? I'm going to sign up for Ditto Music, do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just going to try and squeeze as much juice out of the album as possible, see what people are responding to. Um, just found out one of the tracks on there is on Top Boy as well, so I'm going to release like a deluxe album around the time try and divert people's attention back to it. And then I don't know, man. I don't know about you artists, but when someone asks what's next, I'm just like, mm. I just want to go on holiday, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so I <won't> yeah. <laughs> okay, so you've got Ditto X in November, but the big one for <coughs> us, you guys at Leicester, we've got another boot camp. So um, September the 9th, Saturday, September the 9th, from 12 to 6. Um, we done it with you, you last time, didn't we? your place but we're going to bring loads of industry um, professionals and artists together. We're going to do some network and then we're going to look into some like a variety of different things. We're going to have PRs there, PPL, etc. Some of those organisations that need to support artists um, and industry professionals. But thank you very much for being here. I hope, hope this all resonates and it helps you do what you do better. <laughs> Evaluations! And I, I do want to say, one of the in the evaluations from last time we've done a run of these, people said they wanted it live streamed and filmed, and, and DJs made that happen, so it is paying attention to, so please do. You're sticking it on you, bro. You're letting you off, man.